We now move straight away with uh, those thoughts, that warning, into our first panel discussion. And let me just remind you, dear ladies and gentlemen, that we're also very eager to hear your questions to our panelists. You can submit them on the conference website using the code that was sent to you by email, and then I will bring them in and pass them on to our panelists in the course of the discussion. So please do interact with us, because we're very, very eager to hear your views and concerns. We want to use this first discussion to drill down on some of the risks that were highlighted in those two clips from iHuman, as well as by our, our speakers, as, and to explore the need and the potential shape of an internationally harmonized legal framework to mitigate these risks. To do so, our hosts have assembled an eminent group of experts, and it is a pleasure to welcome them. I do so in alphabetical order, and I'll just say that uh, our first speaker, whom we did just see in that clip, is not here with us yet. She's uh, joining us from the US, which uh, where it's still very early in the morning, so hopefully we'll have her with us uh, shortly, but I'm going to introduce her now nonetheless. She is Ruman Chaudhuri, whom we just, as I said, met in that clip. She's a pioneer in the field of applied algorithm Ethics, CEO and founder of Parity, which is an algorithmic audit platform company, and she's also former global leader for responsible AI at Accenture. So we're hoping to see her shortly. Also with us is Cornelia Kutura. She is senior director and lead of the rule of law and responsible tech team at Microsoft, responsible for the group's privacy and also digital policies in the EU. And she's joining us from Brussels. Very warm welcome to you, Cornelia Kutera. And we're very pleased to have with us Dr. David Leslie. He is the ethics theme lead at the Alan Turing Institute in London. He was formerly at Princeton University, is an award-winning academic, who also serves as an elected member of the Bureau of the COE's Ad Hoc Committee on AI. That's Kahai. And he joins us from Southeast England. Great to have you with us. Also joining us is Natalie Smuha. She's an assistant lecturer and researcher at the KU Leuven University in the Netherlands with a focus on regulation of new technologies and in particular AI. She has also worked at the EU Commission's DG Connect and serves as an expert to Kahai and she joins us from Brussels. And finally, Francesca Fanucci is with us. She's a lawyer in international and EU law with a focus on human rights and freedom of expression. She's also senior legal advisor at the European Center for Not-for-Profit Law and a member of the Conference of INGOs at the Council of Europe. And she joins us from London. So, Great that you can all be with us for this virtual discussion. I'd like to begin by asking you to pick up on the question we were just discussing with Tonya and Daniela, namely AI's potentially adverse impact on human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. On the basis of your experience, what are the developments that concern you most? And I'll just uh, take it uh, straight down the panel, so um, perhaps perhaps beginning with, uh, with David Leslie. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that um, maybe to mo motivate the conversation a little bit, uh, we could take a step back and, and think in, in, the, in the kind of wider angled lens or through looking through the wider angled lens and, and think about the wider uh, potential civilizational impact of the kind of unchecked proliferation of AI systems. Now, we can think of the emergence of fundamental rights and freedoms, so those that protect human dignity, democracy, the rule of law, um, as having secured a particular form of, of modern democratic life. And, and over the, the past few hundred years, um, the sort of uh, un un unfurling of modernity uh, has placed the burden of, of reproducing the social world um, ever more uh, exclusively on human shoulders through our interactions, um, through the relationships of mut mutual accountability that we have with each other, through our capacity to, to sort of solve problems through cooperation and consensus. And, and crucially, the potential for human flourishing and self-realization has been tied to these kind of interactive and reciprocally accountable uh, uh, activities. Now, one of the things that we need to really think about is that uh, in a world where there's kind of ubiquity 
ubiquitous AI systems and you've got uh, a social world that's uh, where automation kind of uh, not only uh, uh, has uh, ubiquitous capacity or omnipresent capacity to measure and calculate, but has this kind of omnipresent capacity to nudge us behaviorally and to steer us behaviorally, we, we shift the sands a little bit and those basic fundaments of modern democratic life uh, could easily be washed away like a face uh, carved into the sand as Michel Foucault once um, wrote. Um, now, one thing to remember is that on the one hand, we have the growth of algor algorithmic curation of the self, which is in a sense producing uh, or cramping our, our creative capacities in many ways and done at scale through the control or manipulation of preferences that can really affect uh, the capacity for human flourishing. And then on the other hand, on the social kind of level, we've got the, the creation of calculated digital publics through these um, you know, f uh, Facebook and social media algorithms that's, uh, that's that kind of uh, profile popularity and, and uh, siphon our our, our kind of interests uh, if through our kind of news feeds, et cetera. And so you've got these kind of dual individual and social dynamics, which, which come to kind of uh, contest what we, what we think are the formative qualities of modern democratic life. Thank you very much. And let me go on now to Cornelia Kuttera. And uh, uh, we saw a pretty dark view there in those film clips. For you working in the industry, uh, Cornelia Kuttera, are you are you concerned about these developments, or do you say, in fact, a view like that is simply too too dark? Um, I, I very much liked the the intervention where where it was underlined that it is our choice and it is us to decide which way we are going, um, and I think that there is a lot of truth in that, and hence um, initiatives such as the work of the Council of Europe at CAHAI are really, really important. Um, when I go to the, the, the concerns, I think that are very, very stark. Um, in the work Microsoft is currently doing and implementing and operationalizing its principles, its ethical principles, and this was also mentioned, the ethical principles and rule of law um, and, and development from one to the other eventually, which is, uh, bringing this in a legal framework, we have we have um, gained now almost two years of experience in doing so, and really um, in in that process in building out an AI governance model, we've come across like three major concerns. I might want to add one additional one. The first is impact on fundamental rights, um, impact on harms that can impact phys physical harms. And then the third one where um, there is an impact uh, on citizens when it comes to potential denial of services. And some of those were also mentioned uh, in the clips as well. Could, the, there is could, I just event, ask, could I just ask you to give us one concrete example of the physical harms? Are you thinking of the use of AI, for example, in autonomous driving? Or what do you have in mind or, there? or in, in military uses eventually as well. So th there is a couple of those examples you could mention in the fundamental rights uh, category. Um, the one we have very early on build red lines into what we support and where we engage with customers is facial recognition. There's specific use cases that we have not entered into contracts. So, so there are there are a, a number of use cases, and as we have built this out, we are learning from those use cases ever more to fine tune how to how to build this responsibility into the engineering process. Thank you very much. I want to come back to uh, solutions and uh, potential uh, areas of either voluntary initiative or uh, regulatory, but let's first stay with risks uh, from uh, diverse applications of this technology. And let me move on now to Fran Francesca Fanucci and pose the same question to you. What developments concern you most? Thank you, Melinda, if I may, and also for having me uh, in such distinguished company. Well, first of all, our concern as a civil society, the civil society group that I represent, most of all is that the overall public debate uh, um, on uh, 
the use of algorithm-driven processes on AI in particular, its impact on individuals and society, but also on whether we need regulation or not, is essentially still primarily carried out by institutions, industry representatives, experts with a very specific disciplinary uh, uh, profile, you know, be it technical, legal or social science, and also by, admittedly, by some civil society organizations that are specialized in technologies, but there is still no meaningful involvement of a much broader representative spectrum of civil society groups, including, for example, youths, marginalized and vulnerable communities, such as people of color, indigenous communities, women, people who live in remote or rural areas, for example, they don't even have access to the internet, but are still affected by the development of such technologies. And to give you an example, already mentioned by the Commissioner for Human Rights in her introduction, the use, the more and more frequent use of social welfare schemes and programs by member states to decide how to intervene, affected inevitably these people as well. So, um, are you thinking, admittedly, sorry, again, just to really spell it out for those who are perhaps uh, coming to this area with somewhat uh, less knowledge, are you talking about bonus point programs, for example, like the kind that is applied in China, or, or what do you have in mind uh, when you talk about that? Well, the, the so-called citizen scoring program that was implemented all over China, it, you know, brings the level of Orwellian state to, to unexpected uh, levels. But, but there are already, and I'm sure my colleagues uh, later on in the panel from Algorithm Watch will be able to expand on that, there are already worrying examples in Europe as well of the use of these social welfare programs to detect, for example, fraud schemes and we have an example last year in, uh, no, actually, yes, last year, it was 2020, uh, a court in the Netherlands uh, imposed a ban on the use of a social welfare program used by the government to detect a fraudulent scheme on benefits because it specifically violated human rights and targeted only people from specific poor and ethnic based neighborhoods. So yes, that's what I'm talking about. There are also using social services for uh, adoption, fostering, and so on. But anyway, so these people, I was about to say that in, admittedly, some countries do try and encourage participation of civil society groups, even the non-organized ones, but some groups, uh, they, they refrain themselves from taking part in this debate because there is still this misconception that if you are not a tech expert, an AI expert, you don't have much to bring to the table. Mm -hmm. But these people are those who exercise the human rights, those who defend the human rights, and they have a lot to say with regard to how this works and the impact that positive as well as negative that the use and deployment of AI can have. So this is one major concern. Let me add just uh, quickly another one, which is the fact uh, also raised uh, en passant by the clip of uh, the documentary that we have seen, that AI technologies at the moment, for the most part, are developed, designed and deployed by private sector alone. Mm -hmm. And most digital infrastructure is also controlled exclusively by these companies. However, these actions remain vastly unregulated. And even the you know, uh, technology companies have vastly adopted an ethics-based approach in adoptive code of ethics rather than a human rights based approach because ethics is a broader aspirational target but does not include legally binding obligations. I'm, kind of I'm, I'm going to stop you there because again I want to talk about solutions a little later. I just want to stay now uh, a little bit longer with the risks themselves and what I'm hearing you say uh, here very clearly is a very distinct risk that AI will uh, exacerbate inequality and further marginalize those groups uh, you talked about who are adversely affected but not part of the discussion. So let me move on now uh, finally to Natalie uh, Smuha to get your take on the risks that worry you most. Thank you very much. Uh, great to be here. Um, so yes, what I'm going to do is uh, focus a little bit more on these risks, right, this impact. And first of all, what I can already refer to is the feasibility study that the CAHA, so the Council of Europe Ad Hoc Committee, uh, just published in December 
last year, so just a month ago, because it really, um, well, I'm a bit biased because I helped working on it, like Francesca, but, you know, it, it does a good job, I think, in explaining for different human rights at stake, what is a specific impact. And uh, in the seventh chapter, it also tries to explain, you know, what are the rights and obligations that really are essential in, in the context of AI that we should keep in mind. And just to give some examples to make it more concrete, of course, there is the impact on human dignity, right? Uh, the dignity of the individual can be impacted. And these impacts, again, they can be positive and negative. But we're, of course, concerned with the negative impacts because those are the ones that we need to tackle. Um, there can be harm. Uh, Cornelia already mentioned physical harm. There can also be types of mental harm. The use of AI can impact autonomy, right? Human autonomy, human freedom. Um, it can have an effect on non-discrimination, or rather it can discriminate people. This can happen also, and that's important to keep in mind, in an unconscious way. We're not always aware of the fact that the algorithm takes you know, discriminatory decisions. Um, it kind of sneaks in either through the algorithm or through the data that is biased. Then transparency is also a key problem um, because we don't always know how an AI system comes about at its decision, which leaves people a bit in the dark. And that's especially problematic if the decision that is taken is not just which song should I recommend to you on Spotify, but rather, you know, what is a potential legal decision or one that affects you personally, your loan, your house, etc. Um, and then accountability, for instance, is also mentioned. Now, what I really like about the feasibility study is that it goes beyond just looking at human rights because it's important to understand that the effects that the use of AI can have, and I'm careful about saying the use of AI, not AI as such, um, is that it can also impact our broader societal infrastructures, such as democratic institutions, right, such as the rule of law. And that's that impact is a bit less easy to define because there is no human rights language for it, right? You cannot equate it to a human right. It's a kind of broader um, impact, but it's an important one to look at. And that's also partly due to the fact that the public and the private sphere are more and more entwined. Um, that's something that you just discussed with Cornelia as well. Let's think about social media, for instance, right? Um, this is in, in private hands. However, more and more, we are actually having political discussions, public debates on social media. So this private sphere has kind of become part of the public sphere. But the rules that apply are those that apply to private actors. So there's a little mismatch there, right? Um, another example is governments making use of AI applications. Very often, governments themselves don't have the capacity, the expertise to develop AI systems. They don't have the data. So they rely on you know, private actors for the data, for the technology. Um, and there again, um, that dependency also creates a kind of accountability uh, gap and democratic control gets lost. So these are just, you know, some of the some of the risks um, that we need to tackle. Let us let us stay with a couple of those risks and perhaps a quick uh, follow up question to you, uh, Natalie, before uh, I move uh, to some of the other panelists. When we look at the use of AI in predictive policing, uh, we saw it there in the film. And in fact, Ruman Chaudhuri, who unfortunately still isn't with us, uh, talked a little bit about it. Um, to what extent do authorities that are applying AI uh, in this context, to what extent are they being adequately trained, individual police officers or police departments, in the risks as well as the strengths of this technology? Yeah, I think you're touching upon a very important point. It's the broader point of education and awareness. And everything starts there, right? If you're not aware that there is a problem, there's not much you can do about it. And the problem is that there are some gaps in the responsibility because who do you hold accountable, right? These police officers, they probably did not yet get this training. On the other hand, they're probably often relying on technology that comes from a private actor from which they acquire it. So they don't necessarily, they didn't necessarily inquire into how this technology operates. So that's another kind of gap in knowledge. And then there is the next gap in knowledge, which is the fact that you don't always know how the system actually works. Mm -hmm. 
right? Uh, this black box problem, so to say. Now, just to come back on this black box problem, because it's a really important one. So just for those who are not familiar with this, uh, with this language, it's this idea that an AI system, not all AI systems, but some AI systems, for instance, that operate on machine learning, are like black boxes, because we don't really know how a decision came about. Right? That's the black box phenomenon. However, even if there is a black box, you can still find out, you know, as a user or as a developer or acquirer, what type of data was used, right? If you see that that data is, for instance, only pictures of white males, you can kind of understand that probably there will be a bias, right? Even if you don't understand exactly how a decision was taken. Mm -hmm. So the black box issue cannot be an excuse, but you're absolutely right that First of all, we need to have education and awareness raising, both for the deployers of the systems and for the developers of the systems. And I dare say, for the entire population, because AI is being used everywhere in our lives, right? Not only in predictive policing. Um, and I think this is the stage where we're at. Right? I think now and now we're talking more and more about um, the risks. Um, and that's a good thing. Yeah. So hopefully yeah. that will help. Let me stay with the black box issue and get both uh, David and Cornelia uh, to weigh in on this. Uh, David Leslie, I know that you authored the UK government's official guidance on responsible design of AI. So let me ask you two technology questions. Um, first of all, that black box, the opacity of AI systems, the fact that we don't know exactly what the inputs and outcomes, where they're coming from or what they look like. Is there a technological fix for that? Is there a program that would render AI essentially explainable? I mean, that's a that's a, a good question uh, in the sense that uh, there have been a lot of uh, people who have tried to focus on the technical solutions, but I think to to uh, to, to some uh, uh, shortcomings. Uh, in a sense, there's a whole kind of field now on explainable AI that tries to that tries to, to look at these very kind of complex. Um, we call them high dimensional algorithms, like uh, neural nets, uh, for example, and uh, just in in a sense try to model the, the complexity and simplify it through these kind of surrogate models. Um, but the, the issue with, with these opaque systems uh, is, is not that you can just kind of attach a, an explainer to it, a kind of technical explainer to it, but it, it's rather that uh, there are things called nonlinearities and high dimensional uh, correlations, which, which really uh, won't be captured by uh, any type of uh, technical instrumentation that tries to simplify the models. Um, and on top of that, we have uh, this issue that the opacity is not being, uh, is, not, is not simply a, about the inputs and outputs Inputs, right? The opacity is also socio-technical. It's about the, the, the political and social relationships that are, in a, in a sense, translated into the technical machinery and then have to be translated out of the technical machinery. And so I think that we're, we're increasingly um, realizing that when you have systems that are, are so complex that they, they're, they're rendered uh, incomprehensible to humans, we really need to take pause when there are issues that are, affect and impact humans, such as um, potential biases and discriminations that really need to be um, brought out into the light, right? When we, when we not only look into the machinery of uh, an AI system, but when we look into the processes behind its, its building and implementation. And so I, to answer your question, there, there hasn't been a quick technological fix yet uh, that, that gives us reliable um, explanations from very complex models. I mean, progress is being made in that quarter, but that's only a small corner of the problem of explainability. Thank you very much. Let me um, take this uh, issue straight away to uh, Cornelia Kutera. Many of the discussions about the risks of AI do focus on opacity and also on the unconscious bias, that prejudice that is essentially hidden or built into the algorithms. And unquestionably, it's an issue, and I want to get your view on that, but I also want to ask you if there's an argument to be made that the technology can also cut the other way and actually help mitigate structural inequality and injustice. 
Well, thank you so much for the second part of your question here as well. So first of all, I want to um, uh, re reiterate something David was saying. It, it, it issues around AI are largely socio-technical issues. Um, so they have to be looked at from a, a multidisciplinary uh, uh, perspectives. Um, we, we start with our uh, AI governance really in in un making engineers understand that specific issue. So they can ask, so what is the application for their building and start the impact assessment really, really early on in order to also have mitigation processes in place in, in the engineering process right from the beginning. So that is a very new endeavor in, in sort of starting this AI governance. In, in this context, there are, as David explained, there is a lot of progress made. There is not yet this uh, one-size-fits-all solution for these issues. It's also depending on uh, who is asking the question. You will have different models and different solutions depending on what type of eligibility is, is necessary. You will have to make it more practical. You will have a different type of transparency needed for doctor that has to make decisions that in part might be based on, on an AI tool versus an end consumer that has been uh, denied a, a loan or didn't get the loan that he wanted. So, so there's a lot of um, questions and, 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 and work to be done in, in that space. We as, we, as we develop our processes further, um, we have embedded practices and tools such as data sheets for data sets. We're building on others in an open source in, in, in building these mechanisms for accountability and, and transparency into the engineering process. And as the specific question you were asking, yes, there are also tools that are now built from a, a, new, a, a new department even within Microsoft that is really there for scaling out tools in the engineering process that then can be used by our customers as well, such as Fairlearn or Interpret ML, which are, which are tools that will help our customers to make, um, uh, to, to, to help them with transparency questions. An additional point, and that is really something to respond to Natalie's uh, um, point on on education. We also, and this is this is coming from the additional learning that we we gain from these experiences. We've also started to um, develop transparency notes for our customers, so so that they can think about their responsible governance when they are deploying the AI application. So there's a lot of work in process. It's by far not the end of the, 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 the road. And these are the self-regulatory, if you like, uh, developments that you can see across the industry. But there, there is also, and this will certainly go into a next conversation, um, the need is where do we need regulation in addition to that? Quick uh, follow-up question that's based on two different audience questions we have here. One is how do we regulate AI in order to mitigate or avoid discriminatory, discriminatory effects related to gender? And the other one is from your point of view, what are the most promising methods for breaking the biased feedback loop mentioned in the clip. So uh, you did answer those in part, but maybe another word on that. And here too, I would ask you, to what degree is this a technological issue or an ethical issue? Because of course, we often hear that it's because of distortions in the data sets that we have some of these, uh, these unconscious built-in bias issues. Uh, so would simply getting better distributed data sets begin to solve the problem or doesn't it go far enough? I see people shaking their heads. I'll come to you in a minute, Tanochi. <laughs> I, I, will, I, will, I will take the, the second question first and then go back to the regulatory approaches that we can take. Um, on, on the biases, um, there is a lot of work uh, in understanding uh, uh, ML. Um, there, there's work that is 
across industry, the partnership on AI is, is, is having an important pro project in, in this context on transparency, specifically focusing on bias. We have wonderful researchers in Microsoft that have done enormous work around um, documentation, um, because at the end of the day, um, it is good to know where the data is coming from, for what purpose the data was collected in order to eventually uh, think about potential biases. You might have a data set that is very good for one purpose, but might be, um, might might have biases when you use it for another purpose. So um, these tools and practices that are now developed in, in, in the context of AI governance will help to address those issues. And, and we should not forget that the biases often come from the, the, the data that is biased because society has some biases uh, enshrined in, in our social life. So that, that, is, that is sort of what, what they can be reinforced and this is what we need to counter in this space. Mm -hmm. Now on the regulation, uh, very quickly, uh, that's a, it's a very, it's really um, hard how to approach this because as we heard in the films, we use AI everywhere specifically on, on discrimination, at least for the European level, and we have better experts than I on, 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 on the legislative frameworks here. Um, we do have um, non-discrimination laws. So the question here is really, how do you actually apply them in such a broad sense? And, and um, there is, there is potentially um, more scenario-based thinking that we need to apply. Um, and then another issue might be that how do you actually interpret um, a specific challenge that occurs because the, the jurisprudence might not, not be applicable in the same way as it is without AI. So there, there's a lot of questions that follow on and I think we'll be in this discourse for quite a while. We'll, and we'll drill deeper on that aspect in just a moment. But because Francesca Fanucci was shaking her head there when I asked the devil's advocate question, uh, perhaps uh, you'd like to weigh in on that. And then I have another devil's advocate question for you after. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to disparage what was being said. No, 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 In fact, good. it's a question that everyone keeps asking. And, and indeed, I mean, uh, if I may sum it up with a, with a syllogism, you know, we, we are all biased, present excluded, of course, <laughs> but uh, as a minimum, we are slanted and very opinionated into different levels. Point two, the technology is trained and learns from data sets provided by humans or anyway by, based on human experience. So the ultimate point is that there will always going to be an element of bias. And the problem is that the AI technology tends to replicate it and in some cases even to amplify it. And as Cornelia was to pick up from what Cornelia was saying, it's not only the problem for data sets being used for a purpose rather than another. The problem is also that some data sets may be used in certain regions. So they took on people with a certain history, historical background, uh, societal background, same different approach to, to joking or to, to, you know, to all sorts of cultural issues that may not be uh, the same in the places where these, the, the AI derived the tool that tested on that data set is going to be used in practice. So when it comes to the, and I understand uh, that the technology is trying to work on removing this bias, for example, by developing adversarial approaches in order to consistently check the bias and correct it or expose it to different. So we welcome definitely all these technological advances that may help the inherent problem of bias. But we also recommend because uh, by its very nature, like I said, uh, all these tools uh, have uh, a cross-border uh, um, scope either because they are tested all over the world or because, for example, the, if you take the AI tools used in social media, they are bound to have a global impact other than the localized one. We believe that ultimately whatever regulation is adopted, it has to have uh, the broadest possible outreach or at least a harmonized approach mm -hmm. all over the world, which is why in Kahai we tend to favor the idea of uh, 
uh, an international instrument like a convention because, and we do have observers from other non-Council of Europe states, because ideally we will establish standards that will be uh, endorsed outside Europe as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me ask you very briefly uh, this uh, other devil's advocate question that I have, uh, have uh, in my mind. Uh, and it, it's because I'm hearing uh, increasingly in connection with the pandemic uh, from people who definitely have some um, good base of knowledge uh, and uh, experience that Europe and the U.S. actually could learn uh, from Asian societies that are doing better at controlling the virus because they're less squeamish about social surveillance and data harvesting. What do you say to the, that kind of an argument, which is essentially an argument about the costs versus the benefits? Well, sometimes I think it is, uh, yeah, th there is a, a cultural element at stake because I had this discussion not long ago with uh, um, people from civil society, no less, in, in um, South Korea, which was praised a while ago, particularly for their you know, testing uh, and uh, digital testing approach. And they were claiming that for them, the concept of freedom is not so much having their privacy, but freedom of, of being uh, able to to go out and in market, etc. So I would say um, these kind of human rights impact assessments on the technologies have to be conducted, have to be obviously contextualized. There are situations in which we have to be prepared to uh, accept restrictions that wouldn't be possible otherwise. On the other hand, we have to think of the long-term implications of these procedures. You mentioned the issue of the pandemic. In fact, this type of surveillance is, is obviously, this is the issue that makes us reflect on this. But it's actually far more present embedded in our society than one realizes. If you think that we also have, uh, and we don't talk about it very much, but there is a broad proliferation of uh, smart cities or smart city communities, which is taking place across where we use this type of uh, surveillance type, well, technologies that end up in conducting some sort of surveillance to provide all sorts of services to people. So the, the, the promoters, the supporters of these technologies argue that it's for the greater good. So you give up part of your freedom to be able to have better services, better access to medical care, social care, management of climate change, traffic, etc. But in the longer term, because here, especially in the context of the Council of Europe, we are talking about impact not only on individual human rights, privacy and related, but also on rule of law and democracy in the longer term. We have to be mindful of the longer term effect as well. It's not just about what happens now with the pandemic or anything. It's about how this use ultimately shapes the mentality and the accountability of our society. So yes, it's an open debate and I do not draconially put the door, but definitely I remain very wary of uh, bluntly accepting and, uh, um, you know, giving green light to these technologies. Thank you very much. I'd like to move on now to talk about solutions ranging from the kind of ethical codes and voluntary initiatives that some of you have mentioned to full-scale international binding legal uh, regulation, which to some degree, as you pointed out, is what Kahai uh, has, uh, has recommended so far in its, uh, in its work, in its feasibility study. So let me go to Natalie to get us started and ask you where you think things need to go from here. What is your vision for how we mitigate the risks we've been talking about and find an effective and feasible way to ensure that we have beneficial innovation and at the same time uh, that we do our best to, as I say, mitigate uh, those, those dangers? Yeah, um, maybe the first thing I can do is um, jump right at your last words, um, because I think one important thing we need to do is no longer juxtapose innovation and ethics. 
right? Because we often do that. We say, well, what do you want? Do you want innovation and you know all these benefits or do you want ethics and, and <laughs> rules and values? Um, but obviously, I think we shouldn't forget, I mean, I think now there is more and more awareness that technology is not neutral. Right? There is a very political aspect to it because of our biases, because of the choices, why develop this technology and not another. And you could say the same about innovation in a way. Innovation is also a political thing. It's a political choice. So it's in fact also embedded in these ethical, legal questions. It's part of it. So we need to look at these things together. Um, so now as to the, the solutions, I think at this stage, because of all the awareness there is now of the risks, um, those who still say that we don't need any binding regulation, I think we can compare them a bit to climate change deniers, right? I mean, we are, it's clear that there are these risks and that we need to tackle them and that current regulation falls short. Of course, it's not like we have a legal vacuum. There are already some rules out there and we have human rights, right? We have also the European Convention on Human Rights. But if you say that all we need is in that convention, that's an argument I'm stealing from Jan Kleissen, who will come at a later panel, but it's a very good one, I think. I mean, under that reasoning, you can just say that the right to human dignity or the right to human integrity should suffice also for car safety, right? Why adopt car safety regulation if you already have a human right to physical integrity? It doesn't work. Right? So there is this translation that needs to happen between you know, rather abstract rights that are strong, that exist, that are important, but helping judges, helping um, developers of the technology, private actors who want to do the right thing who most of the time, I mean, I'm an optimist in that, um, to help them with more legal certainty to know, okay, what does it mean to implement human dignity when I'm developing this technology to ensure non-discrimination? And I think it's also urgent thing to do because there are some risks of AI and I know I'm going back to the risks but it's an important point that are irreversible right let's talk about facial recognition technology I can change my phone but I can't change my face or not that easily right once that infrastructure is there once that digital print is out there it's that's done it's done the same with social media right you have um, algorithms that are used to polarize societies. We've seen the effects also in countries that are supposed to be beacons of democracy and rule of law. But once that happens, it's too late in a way, right? Your society is already either radicalized or polarized or you have fake news spreading. Um, so these countries who say, well, let's just wait and see what others do and let's just, you know, go as we see there is a very big risk there precisely because of this irreversibility of some of the harm. So I think that's, that's the main message from my side. Thank you very much. And let me pick up uh, on that point and uh, go to David uh, Leslie. And I have an audience question here, uh, David, uh, which essentially asks uh, also uh, in, in a way about irreversibility. It's this, how far away from the point of no return are we in effectively regulating AI? I mean, we have we have some ways to go. Clearly, um, not least because of the um, you know rapid pace of the development of the technologies. Um, I think to step back from it, though, um, Alvin Toffler, uh, an American sociologist, talked about future shock um, a number of years ago, and this was the idea that uh, the pace of the technology was going so fast that uh, we couldn't keep up with our, uh, our norms and our values in order to effectively kind of constrain, control, and regulate the technology. And, and I, I just point out, and, and I think I'm gonna echo something that Natalie said, that actually uh, we make the technology and our practices are, are those that, um, that, direct the, that, that set the direction of travel for the innovation themselves, right? The innovations are what we choose to, to make in the world. Uh, and, uh, and so I think that where we, need to, where we need to go from here is we need to, to start thinking about uh, the democratic governance of the technology and we need to start thinking about, and I think this is, this is, the, I think this is the real policy innovation of the Kahai and, and its feasibility study, that, that we're at a point now where we need not just to think about 
uh, technology as a runaway element in society. We're in a point now where we need to think about sustainable human-centered technology that, that is uh, directed in accordance with our sense of, of human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. And, and what, what that really takes in, in, at the end of the day is a, sh a kind of a, a new vision or a shift in the visions from where technology is. And right now, uh, AI and algorithmic systems are not being produced sustainably, both uh, in America with, with the kind of big tech um, uh, monetization models, the kind of extractive mentalities that that's, that simply tries to build uh, a lot of, of data and algorithmic processing infrastructure and extract as much value as possible from society. That's not a sustainable model, right? That's not a way to, to in a sense, uh, direct the governance of technology. And so what, what's happening, I think, with uh, the Council of Europe's work is it's looking at, well, what if we put society first, and we think about in a very inclusive and uh, diversity sensitive way, how we can kind of incorporate uh, those constraints that, that are familiar and that have produced the democratic forms of life that we enjoy and the forms of human flourishing that we enjoy. And, and so that, that, that effort is, is, is where we are now. I'll just say one, one more quick thing, which is um, in, in one of the earlier speakers talked about how we need to move away from ethics now and how we need to move towards law. And I just want to point out that I, I, I think that's a kind of a false narrative, um, just in the sense that when we have uh, ethics, ethics forms the normative vocabulary through which we are able to, to use law, even human rights, right? Human dignity is an ethical concept. And I see Francesca's finger, yeah. lays on her finger. Yes. So uh, just really quick. So I would just say that if you look at where we stand today, as opposed to where we were five years ago, right, there was a, a ton of human, uh, a ton of ethics frameworks that were built out early on, right? We have 80 or more ethics frameworks. But what, what we've really come to at, uh, now across the years is more of a consensus about those kind of crucial dimensions, those crucial elements of the ethical frameworks that now can, can be incorporated into statute, that can be incorporated into regulation. So yeah. let, me, let me take that point and go to Francesca. But Francesca, I'd like to add something to it, because sometimes we talk about ethics as if there's some clear code of ethics out there, and we all know exactly what it is. But if we were talking about responsible design in AI and, for example, trying to program a certain ethical uh, uh, behavior or decision-making pattern into autonomous driving, would we take utilitarianism? And then how would we decide which person the car should hit? Um, that clearly poses an extremely difficult question. When I was a young lawyer and we were talking about medical ethics, some of the states in the United States were actually forming commissions that had philosophers, rabbis, Catholic priests, uh, doctors, and many other members because these issues were so difficult, and that was pre-AI. So how do we do that? First of all, I mean, thank you, David, for raising uh, this issue, because I wanted to clarify, I did not talk about law as such, I talked about human rights, which obviously are, are uh, enshrined in law. But the point is that the norms of law are not empty shells. They contain, they uh, detail out principles that refer, obviously, to a certain ethics, moral, you know, what we believe in that is in translated into enforceable measures. So, I don't see ethics and human rights or ethics as law as a trade-off or two completely different. They are actually embedded in each other. Where I do have a problem is when we, you know, we started, and it was right to do so, we started the debate on AI with a reflection on ethics. Now it's time to move on, to improve, and to develop the, the, this uh, debate into an issue that still takes into account the ethics because those are the guiding lights. Those are the overarching principles, the framework that guide us. But now we need, as Natalie first pointed out about the principles, the principles are already there. We need to tailor them, contextualize them, detail them out to the context. And there is not much time, to be honest, these technologies develop at such a fast space where we're still, the, it, it's good to keep up with the debate on ethics, but it's not enough to have ethical codes. Most of all, and forgive my, my own legal bias, 
ethical codes are not binding. I see them as the same as with soft law or self-regulation. It's useful, it's necessary, it provides the necessary complementary flexibility, but it's not enough. We need, and we need a legal framework and we need it to be as prescriptive as possible. Even in the case that you mentioned about uh, Melinda, uh, about the, 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 the self-regulatory cards, obviously, the, whichever rules we, we, we provide and uh, will we, we, we cause frictions, will cause problems, it will depend on society. Even, even uh, the principle do no harm that is normally used as a point of reference. Uh, to whom? You know, why, why should you prefer one thing or another? So that's a problem that remains. But it's all, again, it is an ethical problem. So when it comes to solving that problem, the discussion on ethics is the basis, but not the ultimate tool to use. Thank you very much. Let me now go to Cornelia Kutera to pick up uh, on uh, some of these points. And interestingly enough, uh, Cornelia, your CEO was one of the first tech leaders, first big tech leaders, to call on legislators to take binding action. There's a, a general uh, uh, perception, perhaps a bias, that industry tends to prefer voluntary approaches. So why did he move out uh, proactively uh, in that direction? I think it's an acknowledgement that one, one company alone will, will not Will, will will not be succeeding if there are not red lines that are legislated. So there is a sort of a level playing field. We need to we need to ensure that there is a legislative level playing field. So there is not a race to the bottom that will will start when some companies want to do the right thing um, and build out those self-regulatory uh, or co-regulatory um, initiatives versus others that won't. I think primarily this is a, this is a core issue. The, 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 this, the other aspect is the sheer impact that it might have. I think we discussed this in the first round and, and that this, this requires simply uh, legislative um, boundaries uh, in this space. I wanna, if I, if I have the word, I wanna go back a little bit to a couple of the points that were mentioned uh, um, now very quickly on, on the tracing app because this value tensions, and this is also an important part of the AI governance and that, that the standard that we are um, scaling out across our engineering processes is really at the beginning understanding really well what the value tensions are. Uh, so it's not only at the end as we saw the discussion with the tracing apps that you then have this very heated discussion around um, privacy versus, um, versus um, public health. Um, our human rights framework in principle gives us a frame to think through this, which is, it, you know, if you infringe, uh, you can't infringe the core of a fundamental right. There is no justification for that. But if you infringe a, a right, it has to be necessary in the, in the context of public health here. It has to be proportionate and there need to be specific legislative safeguards implemented. So we do have a, a, a framework to think through these issues from a rule of law perspective. But we also have to think through these issues right at the beginning when we start thinking about why are we actually building the AI system. Um, so there is, there is probably as in many other areas, the need for self-regulation. And honestly, um, we should incentivize as much as possible now because all the legislative processes will take their time. Um, they will take their time. They will concentrate on the most important issues. The European Commission has stated they will focus on high risk applications, but we might want to think about a broader AI governance to ensure um, to, to ensure um, the, the responsible deployment of those technologies as well. There's probably also a consideration what is actually a high risk 
in our own structure currently, we, we talk about sensitive uses and, mm -hmm. um, sure. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just uh, had an eye uh, on the clock. And in fact, uh, risk-based analysis is part of what uh, Kahai is recommending. I would like to ask you one quick follow-up uh, question. Sure. You talked about the race to the bottom and uh, the level playing field. Let's say that uh, the Council of Europe uh, and also uh, bodies in the US decide, and, and certainly Joe Biden has talked about uh, tech regulation as one of his, uh, of his goals going forward. Let's say they both decide to move forward uh, in a pretty comprehensive way on a binding legal framework, but other regions don't go along. Would that be a competitive disadvantage for companies based in those regions? Or could you even say it could be turned around to become a competitive advantage, as in the sense of transparency made in Europe and the US. We have made the experience with GDPR um, and, and an extensive com compliance work. This was necessary across all our processes and engineering teams um, that GDPR compliance um, is is a is an advantage. Um, we have actually um, provided the um, data subject rights not only to European citizens or European data subjects, I shall say, but uh, worldwide. And and we we have noted that those have been taken up with interest also from other regions. So. Um, Providing responsible AI is a is a matter of building trust in the technology, uh, and we are building out our technology. They have to be fit for for European values and not the other way around. So we 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 do see this as a necessity, but also as a necessity to in, ensure trust, a necessity to, to be fit for European values, but also as an advantage in, in the broader sense. There's the last point I think uh, I'd, I'd like to raise here. We were delighted with the European Commission's note uh, issued on potential potentially reinforcing the transatlantic cooperation. And specifically, they mentioned uh, EU-US um, agreement on AI, and we hope that those joint values that, that exist uh, across the Atlantic could, be, could really be, be of help in, in providing a, a more global, beyond Europe regional uh, agreement on how this should be regulated. Thank you very much. Let me move on uh, to uh, Natalie Smuha now. And Natalie, I, I definitely want to get your view on that general question of what a feasible and effective uh, framework could look like going forward. But I'd like to include two short audience questions uh, as well, if I may, since uh, our time is uh, slowly becoming limited. Um, so the first one of those if you can just keep it in mind, is what impact AI will have on young people, meaning teenagers and early 20s, and whether we need legal action to prevent harms there. And the second one, um, this is a big scope, but I'm just going to throw it out there as well. Can administrative procedures ensuring legal remedies and human control counterbalance possible errors produced by AI systems? So essentially asking you what uh, elements a good regulatory framework would need to have to also address those issues. OK, yeah, those are not easy questions. Um, and maybe I can start with that. I I think, you know, in my previous point, I said that it's clear that regulation is needed, that something binding is needed, and there is a growing consensus around that. It's still a little bit less clear what that regulation should look like, right? Uh, we should be honest about that. There is less consensus about that throughout the world, and that's actually exactly what we're trying to do with the Kahai, right? In the coming year, we will be trying to figure out, okay, we have this framework in the feasibility study. Now let's dig into it and see what exactly should that look like. Um, it will need to be as global as possible um, because it's important to have everyone on board. So that's, um, you know, going back to your first question at the same time, I, I think there should also be a sense in which we say, look, we have these values and these values are a part of our history. 
right? We, we've grown into these values. These are part of our country's histories, region histories, and we should be proud of that. Right? So there should be some things on which we don't want to compromise. Um, in Europe, we're also not okay with, for instance, having human cloning. Are we missing out on potential benefits? Maybe yes, but that's okay, right? As long as we are assertive about this is what we stand for. Because again, innovation just for the sake of innovation is not what we're after. We're after innovation that can bring us individual and societal welfare. So it needs to fit into this broader framework. Um, but I do think that there are more and more like-minded countries that share these values. And so we need to cooperate with them. And hopefully, you know, as we go along, there will be ever more countries joining that. Um, the question of the legal remedies, whether they can counterbalance errors, sure but only ex post, right? This is when the error happened, when the harm happened, and then you go to court. That's a little bit the situation we're in now, you could say, right? There are already existing rights, and you could go to court and claim your right and claim compensation. But one of the things that will be important for the content of the legal framework um, is that we are shifting a little bit from just a rights approach to also an obligations approach. Because as long as you stick with only rights, the onus is on the individual. The individual needs to know that their rights were harmed. He needs to have the resources to go to court and claim compensation. And sometimes the harm can be relatively small, so they won't even go to court in the first place if they already know of the violation. So we need to shift that, right? That's where obligations come in. Having ex ante obligations on those who develop the technology, be it private or public organizations, so that they take into account the necessary measures to prevent violations from happening in the first place. Of course, there will be always errors, right? There, the technology will never be infallible. And that's where administrative and legal remedies come in. But there is a job to do first. Um, I'll also briefly go into the question of the young people because it's of course very important. In young people today, they grow up obviously in a very different world than they did 20 years ago. They are used to having constant access to the internet. They have their phone even closer to, to them than us. But at the same time, um, I think that the last generation, I'm not alone in thinking that, is actually also asking the right critical questions more and more. They're not taking everything for granted, things that maybe we are starting to take a bit too much for granted. You know, they're very privacy sensitive. And that's, of course, where the job of education uh, comes in. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that can help that, I think, is also our language use. I think we need to change the way we talk about AI. Right? We should not say AI is discriminating people. We should say it's the company or the organization that uses a biased AI system that discriminates people. Right? Because that creates a mindset that is actually the right one, that, that places the human responsibility first. And if you use the right language, you're going to think about it properly. But maybe just to conclude, I mean, this is not a sprint, right? This is a marathon. We're in this for the long run. There will be a lot of work ahead. Um, at the same time, we know that there are some irreversible harms that we need to tackle. So speed is a bit of the essence. And even in countries where we could not conceive that rule of law or democracy could be an issue, we notice that these are fragile things. So we do need to you know, work ahead as, at full speed. Thank you very much. Let me go to uh, Francesca first and then David with the request, if you would, for very brief answers. But we have an audience question here I'd really like to pick up on, and I also have one more of my own. So I'll start uh, with Francesca. The audience question is about the, uh, your thoughts on multi-stakeholder approaches to create norms. And I'd like to take it back, Francesca, to what you said at the outset about the fact that marginalized uh, groups are are often not adequately being brought into the discussion. So how can we bring them in briefly, if you would, because then I do have one other quick question for you as well. Yes, uh, we can definitely use some of the existing uh, um, discussions uh, could uh, uh, try and involve proactively involving these groups. Uh, not When I say proactively, it's simply not putting up a consultation and waiting for these people to come, but go to them with specific mm -hmm. questions. Because like I said, some of these groups don't even have access to technologies. 
which is challenging nowadays in these times, but nevertheless, so governments or regional bodies should proactively map out and reach these groups with questions. Secondly, there are uh, interesting examples. CAHA itself now is about to start a consultation on the feasibility, on some key issues of the feasibility study, and we have recommended a broad area of uh, stakeholders that need to be consulted, so we will be working on that at CAHA level. There is an interesting multi-stakeholder process represented by the UN Human Rights Guidelines on Business, the, principle, the Guidelines on Business and Human Rights. It is a periodical uh, um, mechanism which includes a, a multi-stakeholder process and we, we, we value it, we think it's a good model, it's a good practice. Last but not least, member states now are developing more and more, at least in, in Europe, in America, and Latin America, not so much in Africa yet, but national, policy, national policies on uh, artificial intelligence. Those instruments, which are kind of three to five year plans for development of AI within their countries, those are excellent instruments as well that could be open to participation of uh, marginalized, vulnerable groups, uh, as well as other types of civil society. So that is to answer this question. Okay. And the, the, the first question, uh, the, you, you had also another question, I think. I have, I have another question. It's actually a really big question, but I'm going to ask you to please keep your answer to it as brief as you can. It's about uh, the risk of AI-based tools that amplify disinformation, conspiracy theories, and so on. Uh, a risk mentioned by the German foreign minister in his remarks, and uh, we saw the real world consequences of this risk in the attack on the US Capitol on January 6th. So my question is this, is regulation the best way to address this? Can we really compel the platforms to be, become curators of misleading content? Or do we need to look at measures that actually aim to reduce concentration in the social media sector? We need a lot of uh, concerted uh, interventions, uh, multilateral levels. We need, obviously, the usual educations and uh, on, on the use of technology, but that's not enough. We need regulation to, but you, it's not regulation to thrust on the companies, on these internet providers or social media, the responsibility of acting because they are not the political bodies accountable to us. They are private entities, unless you're thinking of nationalizing them and making them because of the role that they occupy. But that's not my idea. So I tend more to hybrid solutions, which include uh, governance, broadened governance within this body with multi-stakeholder representations again, where they have to abide by certain rules, but they also have to be helped to identify those rules, and there has to be there's, there has to be an increased accountability on how they make their decisions to either remove or accept content. So this entails probably a new model of governance, semi-public or semi-private, without entailing the ownership of the platform itself. But it's definitely not regulation as such that will solve the problem. It is uh, cooperation within the two bodies and flexibility in dealing with uh, responsibilities that will help, uh, hopefully, in the, short, in the medium term, no, if not the short, to move along. Thank you very much. And now to David Leslie uh, with uh, very little time remaining on the clock. I'm sorry about that. But I would like to get your uh, thoughts as well on the question posed by an audience member um, about multi-stakeholder approaches to creating norms. But then the, the question also goes on to ask, is the gap between East and West actually bigger than that between private companies and governments? And if so, what do we do about it? Okay, so uh, on the multi-stakeholder question, absolutely, and, and we have um, a lot of uh, protocols in place and, and processes that encourage things like participatory co-design, social mobilization, and community-led participation in you know, building policy and also building technology. And so we, we need to do a better job, I think, of really understanding that democratic governance of technology and technology policy really means grassroots engagement. And, and we, we need to start with 
um, there's a, a concept called strong objectivity, where you start with the most marginalized populations as, ha as you need to amplify the voices of the most marginalized populations in order to really understand those kind of stratifications of power that need to be redressed through the, through the, through the, through the policy um, innovation. Uh, the second question, uh, the East-West question. So I, I, I think that one of the uh, moments that are, is coming up for, for technology policy is the intercultural moment. Um, these problems that are being raised by artificial intelligence are global problems that aren't just impacting Europeans or Americans or people from Asian countries. They're impacting us as, as citizens of the biosphere, as, as members of the greater environmental whole. And, and so we simply need to, to sort of do the best job that we can to have um, so-called Anglo-American European values put into dialogue with Ubuntu values or Neo-Confucian values or indigenous uh, cultural values. And, and if we make that move, I think, and this, this goes to the East-West question, I think we'll find uh, that notions of uh, collect, you know, co meaningful collectivity, solidarity, um, notions of individual flourishing, notions of individual will and freedom are, 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 are intercultural. They, they span well beyond just, I mean, our, you know, our conceptions of human rights or conceptions of so-called Western values. No, I mean, there's a human uh, dimension to our everyday lives and how we build and use technology. And, and that, that simply stretches beyond the arbitrary geopolitical borders that we, uh, we could have defined ourselves by nowadays. Thank you very much, David Leslie. Very nice last words for this extremely thought-provoking panel. Many, many thanks to all of you for sharing your views and your insights uh, with us. And we will pick up on a number of uh, the points that you've made in our further panel discussions today. So dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, and by the way, uh, there was one more question from the audience on red lines. A great question. We're not going to have time for it now, but I will bring it in uh, in uh, one of our further panels later on.